you know, you've been going through this series about what love is and what does it mean to love and what is a God-honoring relationship. Recapping, what I, what I think Rob talked to you about last week was how we're worthy of love, right? God loves us. We're worthy of love. Well, therefore, if we're worthy of love, then is there anyone not worthy of love? Everyone's worthy of love, and that is cut and dry, right? It's easy peasy, no big deal. It was such a big deal to God, though, that he summed up the entire law. You know, all 613, if you look at all those books of the Old Testament, he summed it all up by saying, love God and love others. So if you'll read John 13, 34 through 35. Now, this one messes with my head because If I was in charge of telling everyone about God, this would not be the first thing that comes to my mind. But when God says, hey, everyone's going to know that you're my disciple if you what? Love one another. That's how they're going to know that you love one another. Or that's how they're going to know that I'm with you, by how much you love one another. And for me, first of all, that's super hard. And the other thing is, I go, come on, you know, couldn't, you could do fireworks in the sky or like, you know, the big words in the sky said, Jesus is God or something, you know, and I'd be like, yeah, that's how I would do it. But Jesus takes a better approach and says that people will know that this is a real thing, that I am with you, that I am God, that I love you if you love one another. That's hard. In fact, it's impossible, apart from the Holy Spirit, to love as Jesus loved. But that's what's going to draw people. We're not perfect. You know, no church would say that they are. But with that as our goal, it sets us apart from a lot of other communities. And people are really hurting. You know, they're lonely. They're hurting for a community that is a loving place that's going to take them in and love them. Jesus is saying, just as he did 2,000 years ago, he's saying it today. It's just as important now that, hey, people are going to be drawn to me, Jesus, if you love one another. But uh, let's take a look at Matthew 12, 33 through 37. Anybody who goes, oh, Jesus was so, you know, like a hippie who just loved everybody and was cool with anything. Like, these are some of the words that counteract that statement. Jesus was going to people who, these Pharisees and other people were like, we are the true followers of God. All of you, you don't even deserve to be here. And he was saying, you brood of vipers, like, you're messed up. Here you are claiming to be following me, and yet you're spewing out all this stuff. You're saying, oh, wash your hands and do the right things. But inside your hearts, you're full of evil. You're judging other people right now. But on the day of judgment, I'm going to be judging you for every word you've spoken. And that freaks me out. In my heart, there's plenty of things that I am not going to be looking forward to Jesus and I talking about. So when we talk about what we're aiming for at Northview, if you were to become a new member you would see a diagram where we say right doctrine. Well, yeah, that's important. We gotta be right about who God is, about this and that. These are good things and they're important, but they're not the most important thing. Some churches make them to be the most important thing. That's not where Northview wants to be. And then others say, well, you gotta behave right. Don't do this, always do this. That's important, but is that really what Jesus is after? Is he after a church that does the right things? I mean, based on that verses, those verses that we just read, those were the people who did everything possible right. If you looked out, you're like, whoa, there's no way I could be as good as a Pharisee. And yet Jesus was saying, yeah, on the outside, they have all the right actions, but their hearts are evil. Because when you focus on this, it's really easy to start thinking, I'm better than you. And so what Jesus was aiming for and what Northview tries to bring in is the right relationship. And that's the right relationship with God where God is great, we are not, we are followers and servants of him, and also towards each other. Just like Jesus said, love, the entire law is summed up as love God and love others. So when we think about what we want to focus on as Northview, yes, it's important to read the Bible and understand the Bible and have the right doctrines. Yes, it's important to do the right things. However, if your heart is wrong, it's not going to be in the right way. It's not going to be coming from the right place. So Jesus is saying, first, take care of your heart, and then the behavior and the doctrine will take care of itself. So if you're wondering why your walk with God is not where it should be, think about the heart. When you're like, ah, I'm reading my Bible every day, but you know, what's going on here? Or I've, I've stopped doing that thing, but still I feel far from God. I don't feel like I'm, you know, where I should be with God. It's not about trying harder and, and doing better. It's about, are you with God? Are you being with God? Are you loving others? Or are you kind of like, I, I love the people I like. 
I like my friends, but I really don't like those people. And so God is saying, focus on, focus on the heart. First John 4, we've become used to those verses, but they're shocking verses. They're saying God is not going to judge our love based on those that we like. Everyone can like their friends. It's easy to love your parents when they're taking you to Disneyland or something like that. But your love is not going to be judged by how you loved those people or in those situations, but by how you loved the people you least liked, whether they be your enemies or just people you don't get along with or people that annoy you. Every religion, every worldview out there will say to you, these are the people that are right and these are the people that are wrong. Jesus is saying, I want you to love your enemies. I want you to love those who hate you and that you hate. Anybody can say, love the people that get along with you. Jesus is saying, your love will be measured by how much you love those you disagree with. Ephesians 5.1, this is hard, but we're told to do this and that it's an offering to God. In, in uh, the translation I pull from, it says, um, this is a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So. You know, we don't sacrifice um, calves like the Israelites did back in the temple day, but this is an offering to God. When we love someone who everyone else is bashing, or when we love someone that bothers us or is treating us badly, that is an offering to God. In fact, in uh, Isaiah and other places, God says, hey, stop sending me sacrifices. I'm getting sick of all of them because you're doing that but then you're going and hating each other and extorting each other. So God is not interested in our sacrifices of like, God, here's my money. God, here's this. He's like, I want your heart. I want you to stop hating the people who hate you. You know me as Phil, the husband of Melissa. You know me as the dad of Ben, Sarah, and Emily. You know me as the I group leader. If you flash back to my younger days, you wouldn't believe it, but I was actually a pretty uh, staunch punk. And I mean the hair, I mean the piercings, I mean the music, I mean the everything. I embrace the punk lifestyle. That's the testimony of Jesus. Now, it's two simple rules to get become a punk. It doesn't take the clothes or the hair, although those look fun. But it only takes two things to become a punk. To not trust anyone and to hate everyone. You do that, you're a punk. Whatever you look like. So I suspect that there's punks, you know, floating around here without the mohawks and all that kind of stuff. I thought I was being rebellious. I was like, yeah, I am going against the world. I am rebellious. I am a punk. No one can mess with me. And yet I was going with the world. You know, this is pre Twitter and all that kind of stuff, but you don't have to look very far to see that people are being pretty mean to each other. Of course, there's people getting along with each other, but it doesn't take long for people to have their disagreements to come out. Arguing and being a jerk is actually kind of easy by the world standard. So if you truly want to be rebellious, that's the funny thing is I learned, and this is what I think Jesus was getting at when he said, the world will know that you are my disciple by how much you love. When I no longer could make it on my own, physically, uh, mentally, financially, it wasn't my punk friends that's, you know, helped me out. And it certainly wasn't anybody else in the world. It was these Christians that kind of just came around me. It was very strange. That I was like, oh, I'm in a church now. This is weird. And they loved me, even though I was very different than them. And that was what started to change me. Jesus said that our faith has to be like a child, like our perspective has to be like a child. So if I was to go across the hall, you know, talk to Kayla's children over there and say, hey, who does Jesus love? What would they say? Everybody! That's the Jesus answer, right? That's the Sunday school answer. Okay, so who should we love? What would the kids say? Everyone. Jesus loves you. He loves everybody, right? This is the easy questions, you know, and all that. And yet, we make it so complicated when we say, yeah, but... I'm not saying, like, go and love other people, and then the first person you walk up to will be like, oh, okay, I was being a jerk, but now I'll be nice, you know, because your love for me. No, it's going to be hard. So we come up with excuses and we go, okay, yes, these people deserve my love. This person's making it super hard. And so, you know, Gary, they're not getting my love. Or at least I'll be nice-ish to them. I won't hit them 
or I'll tolerate them. That's not what the Bible says about loving. It says we're to love everyone like the children would have said. So I want to dig into a couple of key places where Jesus says loving others. And so the first one is we're actually commanded to love our parents. And you're like, ah, did you have to bring up that one? God says to love him in commandments one and two and honor him. And then in commandment five, he says, honor your father and mother. And you're like, ah, couldn't you have said like, honor your friends or honor, you know, the president or something like, why'd you have to say my father and mother? Ah. You don't know my parents. One of the reasons why God probably made it a commandment because he knows how hard it is to love your parents and how much, again, it's an offering to God. Now, loving our parents doesn't mean that we do like robots everything that they tell us to do or agree with everything they tell us to do. It says honor them. Ephesians 6, 1 through 2, we forget a part of this. So out of the Ten Commandments, if you read the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, you'll see that all of them, all these commandments, this is the only one that has a promise with it, that you may live long and prosper in the land. That's really interesting. All of them are, are important, but this is the only one that attaches a blessing. So God's saying, I know it's hard to honor your parents, but if you do so, you will be blessed. It will come back to you as a blessing. When I was growing up, I had um, step parents and I, I knew that they were abusive. I had no idea how abusive they were until I met my wife, until I talked to other people about this. And they're like, Phil, that, that's not normal. I go, well, yeah, I know it was bad. And they're like, no, no, no. Like, why weren't you removed from your home? People have asked, like, why didn't, well, yeah, the police came to the door, but, you know, so people have asked me, why, why didn't you get removed from your home and put in foster care or protective custody or something like that? It was really bad the more that I've, the more that I think about it. But it's just what I grew up knowing. And I guarantee you that plenty of the, the hate that fueled my punk lifestyle came from that kind of thing that happened to me. And those of you who know that I joined the Navy, I joined the Navy pretty much right after high school. And that was to get out of there. I was like, no, I don't just want to move out of the house. I want to get out of here. And so I joined the Navy to escape that situation. And a few years later, when I became a Christian, God gave me this very strange peace and forgiveness for my step parents. And I'm not saying like, oh, I forgive you, but I still hold it on, I'm still angry. Like it was strange because I went from genuinely hating them, give me a chance and I'll do something about it, to I love you. And I went and reconciled with those people and told them how much I love them and told them how much I've forgiven them. I can only say it's from God because those people who abuse me are not Christians and yet they are saying, there must be su th something supernatural about this because I haven't forgiven myself for what I did to you. So how can you forgive me? That was a huge testimony to them. When the Bible says, honor your parents, it's not saying that honor them if they do nice things for you or if they're good parents. And it doesn't say that stay in an abusive situation, but it does say honor them. Let's talk about romantic relationships. So I assume some of you want to get married, some of you will get married, and you have an idea of what marriage is gonna be like, all those benefits and it's a wonderful thing. Let's talk about what love looks like in a romantic relationship because we go into marriage with a certain mindset. So Rob's gonna talk a little bit more about this in, later in this series. If you could read Ephesians 5, 25 and then 28. When you go into marriage, if you're anything like me, you're probably excited about what you can get out of it. Oh, this person's gonna love me. They make me feel so good. It's gonna be great. However, Jesus is calling us to not see what we can get out of the relationship, but what we can pour into the relationship. He uses himself as the way we should love our wives. So there are parts that also talk, everybody always talks about how wives should submit to their husbands. So I thought it'd be fun to bring out the, how the husbands should treat their wives. Jesus says, husbands, love your wives as much as Christ loved the church. And he died for them. So, you know, like that's the standard. So if you're going like, oh, I have to do the dishes or, oh, they do this really annoying thing. Like Jesus is saying like, really? I died for you. That's uh, the mindset we have to go into a relationship with is not what can I get out of it, but what can you bring into it? If you have that mindset, it's going to make your relationship a lot better. If you don't have that relationship that mindset, you're going to have a very rocky relationship and it's going to destroy your relationship because you're always going to be wanting this person to give you something. So then our enemies, we talked about, we 
brought that up in verses before, love your enemies. We're like, oh, yeah, enemies, yeah, uh, like Nazis, right? Um, no, not just those enemies. I mean, you're probably thinking to yourself, whoa, whoa, wait, I'm not in the military. I don't have enemies or, you know, I, I, I'm just, I don't like that person, but they're not my enemy. But who's got Matthew 5, 21 and 22? Jesus clarifies this and says, hey, I wasn't just talking about like your enemies as in war enemies or those people that you would really want to kill. I'm talking about the people that you just said you're fool to. And, and that was meant to freak us out. Now, when I think about social media for myself, this, again, I try and remind myself of this because, man, I don't even want to be seen as an angry or evil person online in person. I want, you know, even if there's a hilarious meme or a hilarious thing that pokes fun at somebody else or, you know, is, is uh, slandering another person, I don't even want to go there. Now, this is not about right and wrong. It just means that there's a right and, way, right and wrong way to do it. You know, we can disagree. So Ephesians 4.29 says... We have to speak truth. We're not supposed to be, when, when sometimes we get this wrong and we say, oh, loving means accepting and tolerating and, and you know, embracing it. Like, oh, I, that's sinful, but hey, I love you, so it's okay. And no, we're not talking about that. We're not talking about condoning. That's not love. Allowing somebody to do something damaging to themselves or awful to themselves or sinful to themselves is not loving. But there's a loving way to do it. And that's with gentleness and respect, honoring them as someone who's worthy of love and who's made in the image of God. Um, 2 Timothy 2, 23 through 26. There's truth and there's falsehood, but we can stir up these controversies. And specifically, Paul says, who stirs up these controversies? The devil. So there's right and wrong. When we're talking about right and wrong or disagreeing, we can stir, you know, the devil will stir this up and to make it a controversy where we'll split churches or we'll stop talking to one another. And that's where it goes too far. So there is a correct way to disagree, and we need to focus on that. We need to be focused on how we can speak with gentleness and respect. If I was going to try and summarize the Bible's advice about relationships, I think it would look like this. Love is not about what you can get out of it, but what you can give. The path to a better relationship is not give me, give me, give me, give me what I want, but how can I serve the other person in love? And the second one is your love towards others is intended to reflect God's love for the church and glorify God. That's why it's about giving. And so our love towards others is not about how much we're getting out of it, but how we are glorifying God. And if you get that today, oh man, you're going to be ahead of the curve. But until you start realizing these two points here, every relationship for you is going to fall flat. Only God in the end of the day can satisfy our love. So if you're going into a relationship saying, ah, this is the one, this person makes me feel so good and so happy and fulfills all my needs, that's great, but it's going to change over time and it's not going to be that way for the long run and it can't satisfy you. In the long run, that person, the, the feeling of happiness and woo, that you get is going to wear off. And I'm not saying in a like not going to love that person, it's just going to change. And that's a good thing because it's intended to point you to God and loving God and not just seeking how you can satisfy your own needs. When I look back at my lifestyle, of being a punk, that punk mindset takes. It's all about what people owe you. There's a parable that uh, in Matthew 18 where Jesus said a king forgave somebody $14 billion. And then this person turned around and demanded that this other person pay him back the $200 he owed him. It was intended to be like, a pff, what an idiot. Like, how could he not see how good he had it? That's what Jesus is trying to tell us about God's love for us. That when we go, you're, I married you, you're supposed to love me, or you're my friend, you're supposed to love me. And we are not remembering how much God loved us and gave up for us. When we're saying, you've been awful to me for three years, I can't forgive you. We're forgetting how much God has forgiven us. You have to remember how much Jesus gave for us. And if you are struggling with that, think about your sin and think of what we owe God and where we were enemies when Jesus Christ came down and died for us. Philippians 2, 3 through 8. It's a weird cure. We want a cure where the other person becomes nicer. The cure to hate, the cure to a relationship that's not going well, is humility. That is the only cure. If you are wondering why your relationship with God is not that great, you're wondering why you have so much hate in your heart, the answer is you need to humble yourself and realize who you are before God. God forgave you more than you could possibly ever imagine. And the king of the universe who made you in your mother's womb 
died on a cross for you. Go and show this world what God's love looks like. 